Good afternoon and welcome to Dark Hour Paranormal. I am your host today, Michael Roser. And I have quite the treat for you folks. Today, I have Peter Moon with us, the author of the Montauk Project books and many others, 44 plus time author. And I am incredibly excited to have him with us today to talk about L. Ron Hubbard, his new book, L. Ron Hubbard, The Tower of Insanity, along with the Montauk Project. And we're gonna go back in the history a little bit here, folks, and hopefully have a great conversation around something that's been around for a very, very long time. But first and foremost, I want to thank everybody for being here today, this afternoon. This is going to be a fantastic time. I won't keep Peter waiting too long in the back, but I will read a quick introduction and bio for you about this individual. If you're not familiar, uh, my friend, get familiar. <laughs> Peter Moon is the author of his most recent book, L. Ron Hubbard, The Tao of Insanity. Born and raised in California, Peter Moon is primarily known for his investigation of space-time projects. These concerned projects from, oh, excuse me, these concerned projects in the past, present, and future that control both time and perception of time. This began in 1990 when Peter met scientist Pre Preston Nichols, one of the world's most foremost experts in the world of on electromagnetic phenomena, who had been involved in strange experiments at the Montauk Air Force Station on Long Island, which included the manipulation of time. Their collaboration in writing The Montauk Project, Experiments in Time, and its subsequent sequels have now reached legendary proportions. Preston passed away in October of 2018, unfortunately. Peter's work caught the attention of time control scientist Dr. David Anderson of the Time Travel Research Center in Long Island, now reincorporated as the Anderson Institute in the southwestern United States, who invited him to Romania and paved the way for him to investigate other space-time projects as discussed in the books known as the Transylvania series, one of which includes what has been called the most amazing archaeological artifacts in the history of mankind, a chamber that contains holographic records of the Earth's history, as well as holographic readouts of human DNA and also other species. Peter's own journeys into Romania have become legendary. And I kid you not when I tell you this is just literally the tip of the iceberg with this individual and the work he has done. It's absolutely incredible. And without further ado, folks, I'm going to bring Peter Moon on and we're going to get this interview rolling. Peter, how are you today? Thanks for being here with us. I'm good, Mike. It's uh, nice to be with you. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So without further ado, uh, we're just going to jump right in, as I kind of mentioned before. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about your book, L. Ron Hubbard, The Tao of Insanity, which was released back in January of this year? Yes, I can. It's um, it's a book that was in process for many years. Um, I had the only reason I even addressed L. Ron Hubbard as a subject um, I, I addressed it in a book I wrote, you know, about 15 years ago, maybe 12 years ago, called The Montauk Book of the Dead. Because the Montauk Project, which we'll be talking about, is, is a book about manipulation of minds and manipulation about space and time, manipulating space and time. Um, because of my involvement in the, in the Montauk Project story, being the publisher as well as the writer of it, uh, Preston Nichols being the primary experiencer. I had to decipher his, his um, very complex experiences. Mm -hmm. None of this would have come into fruition as far as the book went it, had, I, had I not been involved with L. Ron Hubbard. So I wrote the book Montauk Book of the Dead uh, as a explanation. Uh, for my involvement as an accountability as to who was I and what was I doing. That book was more about my personal experiences uh, with L. Ron Hubbard and in Scientology. This new book was written to address more sociological and theological and philosophical, and you could throw some other opticals in there uh, with regards to the subject, because Scientology is now a household word. Mm -hmm. Everybody's heard of it. Uh, 
so it was to address some some issues and and that's how that book came into into fruition and it was released january last year and uh where would you like me to go from there well, it's my understanding that you actually worked in the offices of L. Ron Hubbard. Is that correct? The personal office of L. Ron Hubbard, which was, it wasn't like we were in an office and everybody was mm -hmm. uh, all together, uh, although there were many of us together in one office. There were, he had, he had an entire staff working for his mm -hmm. personal interest. And th that was there were, there were many complex organizations in Scientology. It was very diverse in terms of an organization for this, an organization for that. Um, I was able to um, be perched in a rather, I guess what you would call uh, rarefied uh, clerical capacity in, 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 during the time I worked in his office, which gave a lot of insight that the ordinary Scientologist uh, or dedicated person would not even be privy to, let alone see or understand. So that yeah. that was a great uh, benefit to my experience. And, and anyway, uh, so yes, I had a, a lot of insight into his persona. I did meet him, uh, so on and so forth. Well, to me, that's very important because a lot of people that write about silent, uh, excuse me, write about Scientology and the subject at large, they may not have had any direct contact with L. Ron Hubbard or even perhaps gotten close enough to uh, what he's created in terms of this organization. It's purely an outside view of uh, what's going on. But you're somebody who's been close enough. You had understanding of, you know, perhaps the inner workings that, again, as you're saying, the normal person may not have had access to uh, this information. Uh, what are, What's one of the biggest thoughts that were going through your head at the time when you were involved in that crowd and working with uh, those people? Did anything seem to kind of stick out to you as something that was uh, very incongruous or did everything seem very copacetic to all those around you while you were in that environment? Well, it's like life has a lot of contradictions. Life itself. Um, mm -hmm. Any organization is no exception. I think what you have in that subject is you have a lot of misconceptions about what it actually is and what it says it is versus what people say it is. And, and when mm. I say what people say it is, people who are Scientologists themselves or are very much aligned with the movement and have dedicated themselves don't actually know what it is, what it's supposed to do. Or they, they have some degree but they might be off. It's, it's kind of like, uh, if, I, if I could just uh, compare it to some elite team in football or an elite team in baseball, and you have coaches telling you to do the wrong thing and swearing by it. And you're sitting there and like, oh, oh you know, let's, mm -hmm. let's go to the manager. The manager, no, 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 no. You know, but they're sitting there giving you wrong advice. Mm -hmm. and, uh, on, on many different levels. This was very typical of people doing things poorly, wrongly, incorrectly, so on and so forth, and, mm -hmm. and thinking they were doing uh, the right thing or, or uh, allowing it to be done. So there was a lot of uh, things that were misconstrued, and there was a lot of what you call human behavior that constantly had to be policed and corrected. Mm -hmm. That had nothing to do with Scientology. It had to do with human behavior because when you put a bunch of human beings together, they will often misfire. Mm. That makes sense. Do you think that the power in Scientology comes from the method and the practice in and of itself? Or do you think it's the perceived uh, outside view of, of this, you know, in terms of the celebrity backing and so forth? You know, the, the celebrity stuff is, is really a huge distraction. Hmm. It is a distraction. It is a public relations maneuver to, gee, if John Travolta likes this, it must be cool. Right. It, it, it's steering people into it. And so, like, if somebody like John Travolta or Tom Cruise works hands-on with people in the movie industry mm -hmm. or, or at their homes, their palatial homes, they're going to 
point people in the direction of Scientology. They're going to recruit them. Oh, not because they're on a mission of recruitment, because they truly believe that it's going to help these people. And th so the celebrities uh, who are influencers in that regard are, are considered valuable. But to anybody who was internally involved, they were, I mean, people might, I remember one guy thinking it was glamorous to go to, to JT's house, as he called it, Jan, John Travolta. Mm -hmm. People might be attracted to the glamour, but in terms of actual practice, they were a distraction and often uh, somewhat considered to be lunch meat. And, mm. and in, that, in other words, not so important. Somebody like Travolta would never be considered lunch meat. He was too, his profile was too high. But uh, you, you might be, you know, mediocre celebrities or whatnot. That, that you, if I gave you their names, you probably haven't even heard of them. <laughs> but nevertheless, they were in Hollywood doing this, that, or the other thing. Um, there was also, so, so anyway, um, but the power, the power of Scientology is to, to give a very quick answer is twofold. One is, first and foremost, what it can actually do for the individual in terms of looking, going inside of their mind and looking at it and relieving it, uh, reinvigorating it, de-traumatizing it, which is just pure psychological healing. Hmm. Uh, you call it spirituals. This word psyche means spirit. Now, they're not going to call it psychological healing for legal reasons, but it, it is. And I don't say that with any criticism of, of either party, the psychologist or the Scientologist. It, it's like it's, it had a great ability to relieve one of one's uh, perceived or genuine trauma. So this is what attracts people when they get involved. Like when I got involved it, uh, in Davis, California in 1971, you would routinely see people after their sessions uh, talking to the group and just just laughing their asses off and talking about this <laughs> and that. And it was like, wow, this wasn't like an, an Alcoholics Anonymous session. Somebody uh, saying, oh, I just you know handled this. No, it was it was great relief and it was great funny because you could all we could all relate to it. And then when you got a piece of it yourself, you saw this is this is this is indeed real what they're talking about. <laughs> so this was a great attractor, in addition to uh, personal abilities or experiences you might have on the mundane level, being able to talk to better people, being able to deal with your boss, being able to deal with your girlfriend, whatever the situation was. So mm -hmm. these are great attractors to where you can see the power of uh, basic common sense information and common sense therapy. And, and this is a therapy that a therapist is not, you're not going to buy at a psychologist because psychologists don't work in the same format. They just don't work that way. They work, it's not to, to minimize what they can do, but they don't work for the same amount of hours. They don't work as much intensively. And it's going to be very piecemeal in terms of time alone. So when you put a concentrated effort and it's a calculated effort, it, it does quite a lot. It can do quite a lot for an individual. Now, yeah. second to the power of that is the map that is laid out by L. Ron Hubbard. He did not have a map laid out in the early days, the first approximately 15 years of Scientology or Dianetics. He did not have a map. He laid out a, a map, a gradation chart, and it went from the bottom of the barrel to the apex of human potential, human ability, which was spiritual potential. This was a map he laid out in what he called a gradation and awareness chart. And this was not, not only did he lay out the map, he codified all of the psychological, uh, spiritual counseling techniques that he had devised, and he aligned them in a, what he called a bridge, in a format that if you started here and you went up to here, you were going to get this, which was painted as a picture. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the, the pictures that was painted at the end of the rainbow was not called a rainbow. It was called a bridge, but it was painted at the end of the rainbow was that you would be able to um, leave your body, which they now call out-of-body experience. We didn't have that word back in the 
60s and 70s, mm -hmm. early 70s. Um, and they called it going exterior, and you would be able to see, smell, hear, outside of your body, at will. And beyond that was the ability to um, create matter, energy, space, and time objectively and subjectively to influence matter, energy, space, and time. That mm -hmm. th Those were pictures that were painted. And I would say that people had varying degrees of success or excitement, uh, success and excitement in the direction of that to the point where it was an ideal that was a potential. So those were the two powerful things that ignited it. And then are all, in my opinion, and there are all sorts of subsidiary uh, whirlwinds or spirals of enthusiasm that, uh, would excite people and created a whole movement where some mm -hmm. people are practicing it, some poorly, some uh, not so poorly, and some good. So that that if that answers your question, absolutely. I, I've always thought the attraction to Scientology was perhaps the promise of you know something more grounded. Here's a very left brain sort of way to get somewhere we're interpreting in the right brain, so to speak. Um, I it remember- could be, It could be very yeah. much left brain. Yes, it could be very, very practical and pragmatic. The problem was, was getting the time and space to actually do it, which sometimes cost money, sometimes it didn't. More often than not, it did, but, but, it, but mm -hmm. time is money, energy is money. So you had to get in a sequestered, secluded situation to do this. Mm -hmm. And that could I, rec be very I recognize that there are some techniques in so far as what I've read about uh, that reminded me of recapitulation the way that Carlos Castaneda may have described it. You know, I know he's a very divided sort of figure in our field, but at the same time, I think, you know, at the heart of what he was trying to show, there was something there. So, you know, the recapitulation for those who are not familiar, it's essentially going into yourself and through breath, you're emptying out those old traumas. You're going through every single little bit of your life and to the best of your recollection. Um, we saw some of that in the Scientology training. Is that correct? And if that's the case, what what's, is that the uh, preliminary step to? Well, that's, that's, going that's what it's just, you go back into your past and you address uh, traumas, pains, emotions, sensations, all according to what what shows up on the meter, mm -hmm. the e-meter the e is called, uh, which is basically a skin uh, resistance device, a galvanometer. Uh, Carl Jung used, a, used it, not as precisely or exactly. It was very specific. So the proof of it, you know, people will say it works on sweat, but the proof of it was, is like say, if you were traumatized uh, in your early life by Joe the bully or by your father or by your mother. And, and, and when you these things are mentioned, they show up on the meter. So in other words, Joe the, mul the bully will have a much bigger uh, reaction on the meter than say, well, Susie who lives next door or Jerry who you play Tinker Toys with across the street. Joe the bully will react. And it doesn't even have to be Joe the bully. It could be anybody. So you have you know, that's the proof of it from, and, and, and the, the, the person getting counseled does not see it. It's the counselor who sees that and then steers him accordingly into his moments of being traumatized by Joe the bully to the point where it is all relieved. Mm -hmm. It is all relieved. The trauma of it, um, case in point, is a, is a guy who was, and this has nothing to do with Scientology, but a guy I knew who was bullied severely when he was young psychological, it was probably more psychological than physical. And he went and sought him out later in life as adult. Hmm. He left on his door. He was so traumatized this by his whole life by this guy who bullied him. He knocks on the door and, and confronts the guy. The guy did not even remember who he was. Wow. He had no memory of the incident. He didn't even remember who it was. So like in other words, people get stuck in the past. Uh, ordinary people get stuck in the past. And, and, the, and the thing, whole idea was to relieve you of being stuck in the past and mm -hmm. bring all your attention to the present. I, I do agree with that on many levels. I see that in other spiritual practices as well. And obviously it's, uh, again, how you go about this, you know, and- It is that, not unique. It is not unique. 
Uh, but uh, the precision and uh, amount of attention that could be uh, divested in this, these procedures were extensive. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it was that, that, so it had a very thorough capacity to clean house, not only to clean house, but to take you beyond uh, what you would have ever thought. Like if, if you come into uh, Scientology counseling to get relieved of your traumas with women, uh, you might go in for that and you might relieve your traumas and say, oh, wow, this is wonderful. And then you get hooked on all the other gingerbread because you see that there's much more than you thought. I uh, see. And, and that, that, that worked. In my particular case, I wasn't particularly, uh, didn't feel particularly traumatized at all. I was more interested in expanding and increasing my awareness. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know what was in the caverns of my mind. Now, in the process of doing that, uh, I did find out that I had personal stuff inside of my mind that was trauma related uh, and, 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 and it had more to do with psychosomatic illness, in my case, a sore throat that I would get uh, periodically. Um, not horrific, but very uncomfortable mm -hmm. when it would occur. Mm -hmm. And that was completely and utterly relieved. Uh, so, uh, never, never, ever to return. So, uh, that, that was one, um, and, and I think it's interesting that we mentioned throat because I am a writer and mm -hmm. a speaker and more of a writer than a speaker, but, uh, what you call the throat chakra and, uh, to use Hindu terminology, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the wheels of, of energy associated with, with, the, with the body is very strong and prominent in my life. So for me to have a sore throat was, uh, you know, it's something that an author doesn't really want to have throat issues. Right, exactly. And these emotional, uh, you know, intricacies that are left within our arc fields and within our psychology, they really can be damaging uh, if, if they're not addressed. Uh, I'm going to move forward a little bit here into the Montauk stuff because we have a few questions on those. But before we I'll do, explain, uh, we'll explain exactly how it links up to, to what we've been talking about. That's perfect. Cause I was headed the same direction to ask. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, one, one of the most fascinating and unaccounted for uh, facets of L. Ron Hubbard uh, and is, is a books he wrote in the early 1950s that discussed how spiritual beings were manipulated by what he called messed beings, messed being matter, energy, space, and time. In other words, beings who were invested in matter, energy, space, and time, uh, physical beings, mm -hmm. uh, and, and physical beings that people that were in a body, trapped in a body, thought they were a body, dedicated to the proposition that they were a body, they would use electronics to capture uh, free beings that could, with, with had abilities, mm -hmm. much like you might think of the Greek gods, and then use electronics to capture them and mm -hmm. control them. So that that was, uh, and, and of course, he wrote about these in books called Scientology 880, Scientology 8808. And these were very interesting. Uh, they, I was exposed to them very early on in my experience. And uh, of course, part of what these these beings did and, and was to implant people. He talked about implants in the 1950s, the only, I mean, that stuff did not, was not unique to science fiction, but Hubbard's description of it went beyond what any science fiction writer had written because he's talking about it from a, like almost who had somebody who was reading from a, not a script, but a intelligence files mm -hmm. that, that, that had been downloaded from a spaceship or something. I mean, it was like, it, it was quite detailed. And where, where, you, where did this guy come up with this stuff? That's, that's the question I would have as a skeptic. Where, where did the hell did he come up with it? Mm -hmm. and, and there was, so, so anyway, here it is in 1990, uh, when I meet Preston Nichols in Long Island, and he is giving a lecture, and I'm there to meet him because he's a, he's a prolific inventor. I don't know anything about his detail or his life or about his time travel adventures or alleged time travel adventures. And I listen, listen to this story that, that he's talking. He's on a panel discussion with some other people. Uh, and there's other people there who were involved in, in his life. 
and his time travel projects. But he, basically, he was talking about a whole implant station at Montauk, New York, which is at the eastern end of Long Island, also known as Camp Hero, a, a, an old military installation, including it was an Air Force station. So he's talking about the about using electronics to control minds and then also using it to open up abilities to control minds and to amplify the mental transmissions of, of an individual and what they call the Montauk chair so as to change space and time. So what he was saying was a modern day implant station that was a direct in direct harmony with what L. Ron Hubbard described in more abstract terms in the 1950s. And here it was not on a planet in outer space somewhere, as Hubbard discussed or alluded to, but it was right here on planet Earth. And they, and they were also controlling time. And it was such a compelling story to me, I wanted to know more about it. I said, is there a book on this? And no, there was not a book. And I staked out those lectures that he would give twice a month for about six months before I decided it was okay for me to uh, collaborate with him and, and write a book on this subject, which was quite an adventure in itself. That's incredible. That is incredible. It's almost as if L. Ron Hubbard had some access to this, you know, esoteric information that he was, you know, bringing forward in the way he was. And then, you know, some several years later, a couple decades anyway, were, they were actually using or implementing these sort of ideas in, in their own way in the Montauk project. Uh, that's very curious. You know, I'm, I'm sure there are many who have proposed that L. Ron Hubbard might have been a time traveler himself to obtain some of this information, but I, I just don't know. I, I, he had a lot of insight that went beyond uh, that went literally into the beyond. And um, he's a very, he comes from a very unique, if not strange genetic strain. And his, his descendants or collateral descendants are not necessarily unaware of this. And it has to do, and I, and of course, I have written about this to a certain extent in some of the sequels Montauk mm -hmm. Revisited, yep. where uh, that goes into the occult side, not only of Montauk, but into certain aspects of L. Ron Hubbard. And I, I will do a book in the future um, that goes more deeply into his occult side. Um, I don't know, the, the working title is The Occult biography of L. Ron Hubbard. I don't know if I will keep that title because it's much more expansive than just mm -hmm. that one man. Although he is, uh, he had a, he has a lineage and he's not the only one to share this. And Celtic people are very related to uh, what we would know for lack of a better word as Hebrews. Mm -hmm. and you see this in names like, and there's a, also a connection between the Hebrew, Hebrews and Egypt. And in Egypt, you have, of course, mo the story of Moses uh, leaving the, the Pharaoh to, to go set up the Judaic religion. And there's many correspondences, but in Ireland, uh, you have names like O'Neill, and O'Neill means of, ni ni of, of Neil. Neil is from Nile, which is the Nile River. You have... Uh, the, the tribe of, of Don, which migrates from, the, this is an Israeli tribe of Don, which migrates up the Danube to Donmar, which was called Jutland. And there's also the tribe of Don, or, or the Irish name of Don, like Donegal. It all comes from Don. And then you have other names um, in, um, in the... Um, Irish, I can't can't even think of them right now. Like 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 mm -hmm. O'Connell is like O'Con, like Cohen. Cohen is the name of the Jewish priest, the Cohen or Connell. And and these names you will see. Uh my mother's name was Sweeney, uh, which was comes from Sawain, Sawain, which is a contraction of 
Suleiman or Solomon. It's a mm -hmm. contract. So you, you have all these names. And, and so basically Hubbard, who was very Celtic, very red haired, uh, comes from a lineage that is associated with the, the, what do you call it? The lineage of the family of Amran, which mm -hmm. is where Cameron comes from. Cameron was a big name, Duncan Cameron. Yes. Cameron with, without the C is Amran. And Amran is the name of uh, Mary in the Bible, identified in the Quran, but also she was from the tribe of Benjamin, which is Ben Amman, where the J is silent in Hebrew. Ben means of, 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 or like the son of, or descended from Benjamin, Ben Amman. Now, Amman is very similar to the Egyptian Amman, the god Amman. So this is the, the lineage. Now, why this is important, it's, it's not to say, oh, this person comes from the Christ lineage, because people who've come from that descendancy, that descendancy of, they identify with that, don't necessarily, will tell you that they're not necessarily, it's a messianic lineage. Mm -hmm. But the problem with the lineage is that it gets screwed up because it's like the word for God is uh, in, in some, uh, what is it? Uh, in, in Spanish, it's Dios, which is like Dios is two, double-sided. Mm -hmm. So we get Diablo, the double-sided nature of God. So, so it can get mixed with the other side. The, the, and, and anyway, I describe in the book that Hubbard has a messianic complex. And I don't say that pejoratively. He could identify as a messianic figure, more in the sense of what he would call delivering truth. But whenever you're doing this, it's very uh, pronged or double-sided. And all you need to do if you're a, a Bible-thumping Christian, uh, or even if you're not, is to look at the story of Christ and how, why is he surrounded with the rose, is surrounded with thorns? It's a problematic issue when you're mm. dealing with any of this stuff. Mm. And so, so this is what you're dealing with. And you're dealing with a high concentration of truth, which sometimes comes with a high concentration of negativity mm -hmm. or evil. So, so I would say in all of my experience, he was writing this current and he did as well as he was capable of doing. And that's not to say he was all good, but certainly not to say he was all bad. Um, he was trying to do something. Uh, and, 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 and that's, it, you know, it also, when I put it in these ribbons, it makes it considerably more interesting mm -hmm. than it might be otherwise. And many people get repelled. They get repelled and they, you know, uh, they'll go live in the Dakotas or somewhere where there's not so many people. But the reason, uh, the, the fact of the matter is, is there's something here to be deciphered, understood, and, and learned. Right. Absolutely. And, and that's something that a lot of people don't realize when they start researching this project or uh, even just beginning to read some of your books is how deep, uh, you know, the people involved and the names and the lineage plays a big part in that project and, and how it was orchestrated. Uh, why do you think the project still resonates in people's consciousness today, given that Duncan Cameron had expressed that the project had in one way or another energetically righted itself in a cyclical fashion? Uh, you know, put it in other words, there was a point where Duncan had expressed there was a looping of energy that was coming, I, th I think, uh, within the last 10 years that was something sent out as a result of the Montauk project and that there would be this sort of bounce that came back into play. Do you, do you understand what he was saying with that at all? Well, Duncan uh, spoke very abstractly. Mm. And I had a unique way, uh, due to familiarization, of, of relating to it. However... It, mm -hmm. it, it could it could really throw people off because it was so unfamiliar. But basically, there's a very, I don't, I don't want to call it a good movie, but a very relevant time movie when it comes to time travel. And it's called The Time Travelers. 
-hmm. And The Time Travelers was a movie, 1963, was released in video format by um, EMI Thorne, the same uh, company that released, I think simultaneously, the Philadelphia Experiment um, in video form. Mm -hmm. And uh, The Time Travelers is a, is a movie set in the, well, the movie's done in the early 60s, but it, it's sort of the beginning is the end. It's about a time experiment where they jump through the vortex and end up sort of coming back on themselves. It, it shows the looping effect of time. The mm -hmm. looping effect is very important. Now, it doesn't explain everything that Duncan said, but but there's something, and I only was able to learn this um, when I, as a result of my adventures with Dr. David Anderson, the time control scientist who brought me to Romania, where he lectured on something called a closed time-like curve. And a closed time-like curve is, is identified with what's called the Ouroboros, or a snake eating its tail. Mm -hmm. It's often portrayed in an eight, a snake eating its tail, it's like an eight, like an infinity symbol. But that symbol uh, of, of the, is, is basically a closed time-like curve, which means, like, and we can put it in Einstein's language, whereas Einstein said if, that if you were to draw a straight line in space and go, just it was perfectly straight line and kept going forever, it would eventually curve back on itself. Mm, okay. It was the okay. first thing my father ever told me about Einstein, and it didn't make any sense, of course, because you're not going to be able to do it pragmatically, but theoretically, space time is curved. So, and, and when you get into space time, it's not a consecutive bunch of pictures like a movie with a reel. It's all a bunch of consecutive situations. Like if you can imagine a movie set where each incident, and I, when I mean each incident in the movie is like one second, you've got all these different multiple sets reaching out in all these different directions. So it's mm -hmm. uh, it's not just John Wayne on a horse. It's John Wayne on a horse here, 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 here. And each one is a separate set. Each one is a separate moment of time. And of course, I'm not being exactly accurate when I say this. I'm trying to give a metaphorical description mm -hmm. of, of what time is. So when you, you're, you're going to go around and in the breadth of the universe, you're going to end up at the same point that you did. That's uh, interesting. So when, yes. And now this... This is actually uh, a scientific abstract. It's a scientific frame. And when and I did videos to explain this, and the videos are my, and they're free. The Time Travel Education Center I invite people to go to. And if you go and you watch these videos, and I, I dumbed down the work of Dr. David Anderson, and it took me about five years before I was able to do it after hearing his initial lectures it became very simple to me uh, to explain this. And after I put out those videos, Wikipedia immediately changed their definition of a closed time-like curve, where they said this is one of the most disconcerting things in modern physics. And I was pointing out, I even put that in my videos, what they, they're saying is disconcerting because they didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. They didn't understand it. Um, but... It's, it's basically, so when Duncan is talking about looping, he's talking about uh, there are loops in time. There's, there's multiple closed time-like curves. There's not just one. You could say there's a master one that could be called the prime timeline, mm -hmm. but there are all sorts of things. It's just like if you sent out, uh, you had a bunch of kids and you sent them out all on errands and they all came home. They all had different adventures. They all came back home uh, with different things. It's like, like that. a loop. So Montauk was like an adventure that really discombobulated a lot of mental energy and a lot of it really was a project gone wrong. So yes. uh, that was – so you, you can see that the, the salad – I am dealing with or the meat or the, the dinner I am dealing with in the kitchen is is somewhat abstract, but it's definitely there. And you might say, in my case, it feeds the family. 
<laughs> uh, you know, because I'm writing about it. So it's very <laughs> pragmatic in that sense. But you want in, in life, you want a balance between the left brain and the right brain. So you have, um, and, and that is the whole essence of the messianic formula, uh, for lack of a better word again. And, and that mm -hmm. is in ancient Egypt, the synthesis of the right brain uh, with the left brain, which they called the right eye of Horus and the left eye of Horus. Mm -hmm. So you have a synthesis of the two and in that middle. And I could, I could align this to other aspects of, of Christianity and Judaism, which make it all blend together. The theoretical blending of it is very enlightening, but it doesn't necessarily translate so well to the um, rabble, again, for lack of a better word, the common man. And, and I say that a bit pejoratively because people are so invested with their localized thinking of what they think Christianity is or what they think Islam is that they are eating. Uh, it's like eating at uh, 7-Eleven. 7-Eleven mm -hmm. is very visible. It's very notable or, or convenience stores in general. Um, and on rare occasions, I've been forced to go into one of those stores to try and find something that I would eat. And invariably, I, I don't eat anything. Yeah, well, I know that well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so it's like, oh, be careful of what you eat. So a lot of what you see rendered in, in the name of the Bible or any of this stuff is, 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 is a low-grade 7-Eleven experience, which people are, look at 7-Eleven and, and these stores do a healthy business or they wouldn't be there. Dunkin' Donuts sells a lot of sugar and donuts and coffee, but they, they, they have a steady business. So uh, human beings are struggling to survive and, and don't always have time to eat right or money to eat right. Um, right. So they think, but it's very important. And, and this, is, this is what we're dealing with in, in the bigger stuff. But when you get to the, the statements of Duncan Cameron saying that, um, he's saying it from a very visceral, uh, experiential position mm -hmm. that is that enjoys a, a certain degree of accuracy in what he says. Uh, that's, that's what I would say about that. Yeah. But I always felt whenever I listened to Duncan speak in videos and, and so forth that I watch from the past, uh, I get that, that sense that there's a, a lot, it's just experience that he's speaking from. Yes. He's a very intelligent person. He can express himself, you know, just fine, but he may not be articulate in, in the sense that perhaps even Al Balick or, you know, Preston, you know, we're saying it, in their left brain expression of the material that they had. Uh, well, well, yes, of, yes, very yeah. important. But you see, they were three different perspectives. Preston's yeah. was more of the scientific perspective. Um, Al and, and Duncan's was more of a pure sort of soul experience. Mm -hmm. and Al was somewhere in between. Absolutely. No, absolutely. You couldn't have said it better. Uh, speaking of Preston, you know, he had uh, his space time labs for many years where he would do his psychotronic experiments. Do you know what happened to that equipment once he passed on? Is there anybody else who sort of filled in and stepped up to continue his research? Or is that something that will be left with Preston for the time he was here? Well, it's, it's a, certainly an interesting question. But I'm going to, uh, yet yeah, there is, he did have a very good friend who was looking out to the property, but, and he complained of people ripping stuff off and whatnot. Um, I really don't know the status of the property right now, mm -hmm. but, but I, I will give you some perspective. Okay. Um, Dr. Anderson had a, uh, when I met him in 1999, he could slow time down and speed it up in uh, a field, self-contained field the size of a soccer ball. Uh, a couple wow. of years later, he, he had told me he'd moved it up the size of a basketball. But his main problem was generating, well, it wasn't generating power. It was instrumentation. He said, he, he although he's a, a electrical engineer and a physicist and a mathematician, he wasn't really 
expert in instrumentation. So hmm. it was at that point I suggested a meeting between him and Preston Nichols, who is a genius when it comes to instrumentation. And he listened to me. And then hmm. a lot of strange things happened with David. Uh, that's just around 2000, around 9-11. And is, go ahead. I was just going to ask, is David Anderson still around? Uh, Anderson still around? Is he uh, still doing lectures or anything? Yeah. I haven't really yeah. seen much from he him. Do lectures. He doesn't have a public uh, presence. But okay. he's, um, but yeah, so, so I thought, wow, this would be a dream to get the two of them together. Now, he did agree to sometime get together and have a, a discussion with Preston, a public discussion like it would be on video. Now, I do, I think I might have a tape somewhere of them talking before this, but he had met Preston and, they, and he had come to the, the lectures Preston gave uh, and, and interacted and even gave some. But so he knew Preston, but this was on a more professional level, I was suggesting. Uh, but David never did. And, you know, it's in, in hindsight, it's very good that he did. Because mm -hmm. Preston would have been bringing Montauk with him. Ah, uh, yes. It, and it would not have been good it, 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 because Preston was a very much of a, I guess what you call, um, mess, uh, psychological and physiological mess by, uh, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, mm -hmm. a more polite way to put it. But he suffered from this from what he had experienced. I can only it imagine. Yeah, it doesn't mean he wasn't a genius, but you know, it's kind of like uh, if you're, you know, you're, you're planning a invasion of a, of a country, you, you come in and you bring your, your guys suffering from PTSD to help you plan the invasion. Mm -hmm. They may be geniuses, but you're dealing with, you know, you can't have them in the room, you know? That's really interesting you say that. I, I remember Dronvalo Melchizedek in his Flower of Life uh, <laughs> novels that he released back in the late 90s had had a, an excerpt in there mentioning that he had met Duncan and I, I think at least Al, but I'm not 100%, but I know he met Duncan. And one of the things that Dronvalo had mentioned was that he couldn't get close to Duncan physically because the energy was just so different. And Duncan's energy was so misaligned. His uh, Merkaba or tetrahedral field was just all in disarray that it literally they had trouble getting close to each other physically. I think that's very interesting that you mentioned that. Um, yeah, but I, I wouldn't say uh, it, it was not hard to get close to Duncan at all. He was very unique. I don't, oh, I don't mean just physically, though. I mean, I'm not, I'm there, not were other issues issues okay. there. there were other issues there mm -hmm. uh, that, that prevented his access to Duncan. And, and okay, and, yeah, there were other issues that prevented him access because he tried very hard to access Duncan in other ways. Yes, uh, okay, yeah. Um, and, and he was not successful, but um, the and, and he wasn't the only one, mm -hmm. he was not the only one, but. But in any case, yeah, yeah, uh, Duncan was a very unique character, and um, I certainly learned a lot from from him. But uh, as yeah. I say, he suffered the, the PTSD. He uh, uh, and 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 but back to David Anderson. So in, in your question about Preston's equipment, so mm -hmm. what David and Preston said, even in the last months or years of his life, he said the big problem they had with Montauk was they couldn't maintain the power right. to, to run the time uh, machine with. And they had to borrow it and beg it and, and steal it from other areas and uh, eventually connecting up uh, through space and time to the Philadelphia experiment itself. And that mm -hmm. powered it up, according to Preston. But what David Anderson discovered in his research was that when he was able to um, manipulate time, he found out that he was power was mysteriously entering the machine and they didn't know why but they mm -hmm. found out that they were able to generate power by warping space and time there is a it's associated with frame dragging a process called frame dragging but when you have two areas where uh, space and time is being bent or turned and it's, it's being harnessed 
it, it creates a, a, a discharge sort of like, you know, like a, like an electrical discharge, mm -hmm. but it is massive and it is called space time motive force. That's David's word to coin it. And it generates a huge amount of energy. It, it, it could basically solve all the world's energy problems. Mm. But is anybody interested in this? No. Mm. The, the one that showed the most interest was perhaps Russia. Putin yes. showed interest in it because he's pragmatic. In America, they would deny it. Now, this, this is from conversations 12, 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, you certainly don't see it. Um, China had some interest in it, but they also clamped down on it. Uh, Japan had some interest in it. And, and his, his space-time research, David's, has become very advanced to the point where we don't need Preston's equipment anymore. It's, it's advanced true. beyond that. That's not to say things couldn't be learned from it, but if, if you were to get people using it and bringing it into the forefront in this, in this venue, it's kind of like, uh, I'm trying to think, it's kind of like bringing World War I munitions into war. Yes, that, that, that makes perfect sense. And I was going to ask you uh, in another question, if there was a digital equivalent, given how much time has passed since what they were doing in the Montauk Project uh, today, where you know they could perhaps do this again in a digital sense and, and what the, the parameters of that might be. But I'm not sure if that's just going to be a speculation. Well, I really I'll, I'll address that in, in part because Preston talked about this from time to time in his, his monthly lectures he gave on Long Island here, of which I was always attending and or, or being a, a co-host with him. But mm -hmm. it was um, the, the whole essence of Montauk and Preston's expertise was vacuum tube technology. And vacuum tube, vacuum is basically, a vacuum is a vacuum, you know. The speed of light occurs in a vacuum, as do phenomena such as what he would call a quantum well, where you're, you're kind of bridging into uh, the twilight zone, for lack of a better word. And the, the vacuum tubes he was, he was, he was expert in. Now, he would talk and give examples, sometimes bring in equipment where they were using transistor technology to emulate vacuum tube technology. Yes. And it was always very uh, not quite on the mark. I think that they got to the point where he would sort of uh, endorse it to a certain extent, saying, oh, they've done this. And it stands to reason that they've done everything they can to develop uh transistor or digital technology to emulate um, vacuum tube technology. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that, so I, I don't really know, but, but there's something, there's much to be learned and gained from studying vacuum tubes. Oh yes, definitely. And I, I'm sure that we could talk about that for quite some time uh, considering there were how many different uses have been put forth for vacuum tubes, not just in the esoteric sense that, you know, maybe we would talk on, but in practical senses, mechanical senses, uh, you know, a lot of people are really fixated on this creature or deity of sort that, that Duncan Cameron had uh, purged up from his unconscious to end the project in 1983. Um, I was very surprised when they, you know, Preston, Al and Duncan had visited Montauk in one of their videos uh, later on saying that the junior was still there, this uh, creation, he was still there in some form. I'm curious if because it was a creation of Duncan's that after Duncan had passed, if junior might have left too, or if there's still something residual, have you heard anything about that? Well, just as a side comment, I, I have a friend. I didn't, he wasn't a friend when I, uh, he told me this. I mean, I mean, I don't see him very often, but I consider him a friend. Mm -hmm. He had um, he had been out at Montauk and and they with with a couple other people, and they saw a giant beast out there, at the lighthouse mm -hmm. that they identified with with Duncan's uh, beast that that he had he had uh, concocted out of his mind to uh, destroy the project. Mm -hmm. But um, that, according to the story, is a thought form that was created out of Duncan's mind and amplified 
to destroy the project. Now, when you create a thought form, it, you know, it just doesn't mean because of Montauk being what it was and being that it was propped up with electronics and being that these electronics had amplified it and amplified it into people's mind, it is the kind of thought form that is like the Energizer Bunny. It can keep on going mm. uh, and is not necessarily associated. I mean, it's associated with Duncan, but not necessarily dependent upon ah, Duncan. Ah, okay. Because it's it's like um, the Loch Ness Monster. It becomes like a meme that people feed off of and continue. You can say oh, uh, okay. Jesus Christ is a very powerful thought form that's been amplified, uh, but Jesus is no longer here. He's coming back, so he's not here. So people are living off of that thought form, uh, mm. correctly or incorrectly. So uh, that, and that has no reference to to whether the fact that it even happened in a historical sense. It's it's just that it's a thought form that has been created and fed upon. And it just doesn't have to be Jesus Christ. It can be Napoleon. It can be mm -hmm. Hitler. It can be all sorts of characters in history that that form and um, and, and and give life. Uh, Dracula is is a prime example of yes. a form created by um, by uh, by Hollywood and very misrepresentative of the history and even more represent misrepresentative of the actuality of who he was and what he was doing and how he fit into history. And, and so you have, it, it doesn't really matter the authenticity of the thought forms that people identify with Duncan. It's, it's, and, and certainly that because Montauk is a weird zone, you know, everything is fair game as far as mm. what people think. Uh, how relevant and correct it is is another question. But certainly these things are phenomena that people can and will. That's why it appeared in a photograph that, put with, that we put in the book mm -hmm. uh, that, Preston, that, that was taken by a man named Jan Bryce, who had nothing to do with any of this. He was just out to document this stuff. And in, in this picture of a what looked like a beast, uh, you know, showed up. And that that picture is really interesting. And I know it was uh, you know something that he saw at the time. It was later on after the film was exposed that they yeah. noticed that he was there. I mean, that's incredible. You know, just this one little split moment in time that he was happened to be there for. You know, the synchronicity of it is amazing. Uh, one of the in most intriguing, excuse me, one of the most intriguing aspects I found about the Montauk project is that people involved were going about their normal everyday life and yet living a parallel life working on the project. Uh, do you have any insight into how their consciousness might have been divided, possibly existing in two timelines uh, simultaneously, if you want to call it that? Yeah, I have a very interesting video series. Um, the, 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 it's called The Psychology of Space Time, and it's meant to be a three-part series. I've only completed the first part, and it's mm -hmm. uh, The Psychology of Space Time. The first few videos are free. But they're good enough to understand it because it, it, it one of the free videos talks about the fifth dimension, mm. not the singing group, but the, the fifth dimension itself. And if you <laughs> want to go back and, and read the history of of uh, the Twilight Zone or the or the, the the words they use to describe the fifth dimension, it's it's actually accurate. The, the fifth dimension is is a sort of a potpourri of anything you think. Every thought form has a validity, and, and it, there's multiple uh, timelines. It's, there's multiple realities, mm -hmm. and some of these realities are abstract and fragmented. They make no sense. It might, it, it, it might be like some stupid thoughts you have when you're sitting waiting for something or in the bathroom. They make no sense at all, and they keep running mm -hmm. through your head. I'm talking about thoughts that are stupider than a jingle or a song that runs through your head. Mm -hmm. And it's like, why do you think this? Why do you think, why do you think of this? Like when you're a kid, why, why are you thinking this stupid thing? Uh, the, but there are more cogent and coherent streams of time that, that people uh, think about or experiences. 
as you move, and, and in this uh, psychology of space time on the, it's called the landing page where you go. I, I, I took the work of, don't even remember his name, but I have a, he created a mathem mathematical model of 10, the 10 dimensions. It's all based on math. Mm -hmm. And the first four dimensions are self-explanatory. The fourth being time. Mm -hmm. But the fifth is when you have all these other timelines. You're no longer in the fourth dimension. You're in a multiplicity of them. And so people can live as you get into the upper dimensions, it's other universes. And there's also dimensions like which connect the timelines. Like the sixth dimension will connect the different timelines. So that makes sense to me, actually. Yes, yes. It's a dimension where you, you know, when you get into the first aspects of synchronicity where your your connectivity, when you get into the ninth dimension, and, and I reveal in that ninth dimension, which is I think you pay ten dollars for it, nine ninety nine uh, for for the whole series. But the ninth dimension is a big secret there that I share, which is a qigong secret. Mm. A qigong is is a discipline that I practice that I learned through the modern talk medicine man. But it's like there's something in the body called fascia. Uh, fascia is your connective tissue, like when you open up a chicken. And you see that white viscous tissue, that's fascia. Well, we have five types of fascia in our body, at least, one of which turns into bone, one of which turns into ligaments, one of which turns into tendons. They all have a different gradation of hardness and elasticity. Mm -hmm. The most common fascia is what you see when you open the chicken. It's, it's more, and that's fibrous tissue that connects all of, it brings blood to your organs, it brings blood all over your body. It's, it's what we're made of. It's what in martial arts they call sinew strength. Well, that's connectivity. It's connecting your nerves to your, to your body. In the dimensions, you have an, what's called an etheric fascia. And this is the Qigong secret that reaches out mm -hmm. into your living room and, and connects to the fireplace. It connects to the TV set. It connects to the phone. It connects to the kitchen, the kitchen sink. It connects to the the girl next door and, and the boy next door. It's it's connecting to all of the physical plane. And, and this is how uh, an advanced Qigong practitioner might be able to pull something to him through the law of attraction because he's he's got that connective tissue just in the mm -hmm. same way you can pull your finger closer to you or push it away. That's, a, that's an advanced ability. But when, when you're talking about uh, people existing, now this is a more uh, basic explanation to fit in the complex context. It's a more simple definition uh, of how people could be existing on two timelines. Mm -hmm. So you have people in Long Island working and then they're connecting to another reality that is engaged in manipulation of space and time and in a project. So, and, and there is a connectivity where the person in this life is being under the influence or subdued by that other reality. Okay. This is, this is not a ordinary uh, phenomena that should be diagnosed as psychosis. It could be, but it's not, uh, because it depends how much they're overtaken by that, mm -hmm. that other reality and, and what is their role in that other reality. And what, what I notice with people involved with this phenomenon and people in general that aren't necessarily, they have a hard time distinguishing this reality from other realities. And they don't wish to delineate or distinguish them. And this is a big problem with people. Mm. They don't, and this was the same problem in Scientology. People didn't care that certain aspects of Scientology didn't make sense. And I don't say that pejoratively towards Scientology. You're mm -hmm. dealing with right brain phenomena, nonlinear phenomena, they would call it in complexity studies in science. But there's, there's a problem 
when people don't care about connecting the linear with the nonlinear. They just don't care. They say, yeah, I was, uh, um, for example, in Scientology, um, if you counsel people, you would find out that pretty much anybody you counseled either, um, either was at the crucifixion or was on one of the crosses. Hmm. And there were too many, there's too many of them. Uh, as you say, it would fill, fill a, a baseball stadium. Wow. And because people resonate with that experience. Now that could be resonating with different timelines. It's such a magnificent event. And I don't mean it in a positive sense, but such a strong event that it impinges on everybody's life. Much yeah. like, just like everybody, uh, when I was young, uh, not everybody, but it was to the point where even my sister said when she was young, she wanted to be Mickey Mantle when she grew up. You know, and she was a girl. She because because Mickey Mantle was such a star, like Michael Jordan is today. Mm -hmm. But it, it was like people could identify with Mickey Mantle. It, it's like, oh, everybody wants to be number seven. But it, this is the same thing when, when you have everybody can identify with this incident that they've uh, heard about in the Bible and have had re it's been reinforced, you know, for two thousand years. So this is this is. This is the problem. And, and the real problem is when people cannot distinguish the, the linear from the nonlinear. Yeah, you, you can be Jesus Christ in your mind. You can have been his best friend. You can have been all this stuff. And it, and it might have some validity mm -hmm. in somewhere in the parameters of existence. And it might have a, a, a reality that is positive. But in this reality, this 3D objective reality, where people generally go to work and go to shop and wear COVID masks or whatever, it, its relevancy is completely different. And they don't necessarily distinguish this. And this becomes a, you know, sort of a, a brain that's been, you know, uh, like a grilled cheese sandwich that was left on the, on the uh, frying pan too long and kind of <laughs> cheese melts into the, into the, into the, into the frying pan. And it's sure. Gone. Yeah, it's it's uh, so th this this is unfortunate, but nevertheless, and and this can be a problem for people who were involved with a project, uh, whereas some people can keep it separate and can distinguish it and and treat it as phenomena uh, that they can relate to. But a lot of people can relate to this stuff, which means its influence was uh, generated or uh, and or associated with with something that could be called parallel timelines or uh, multiple timelines or infinite timelines. If that answer, that's a long winded answer. No, but that you bring up a really interesting point. Have you ever met anyone who didn't necessarily have direct involvement in the project yet, perhaps through dream states or astral travel of some sort are somehow connected. You mentioned energetic connection or, you know, something along those lines in terms of mentality. Well, there, there's people that, that can tap into that, can read the book and tap into stuff like that mm -hmm. and really relate to it on some level, relate to it very deeply and very subjectively, and at the same time, not collapse reality. Mm, okay. And, you know, co collapse reality, because when you, you start collapsing reality and you start denying this reality, it, it leads, leads to problems. Mm -hmm. Unless you're going to leave this reality altogether, in which case it might not. But if you're going to, you know, I, you know, I've had people that were very, you know, well-known and supposedly well-informed say, you know, you're not going to have to pay your mortgage anymore because we're all going to move into 4D and it won't matter anymore. <laughs> well, well, he didn't say that. I said, so, so you mean I, I don't have to pay my mortgage anymore? No, no. Uh, no, that's still third-dimensional responsibilities for sure. You know? Exactly. <laughs> but the person really thought that. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's, it's just like losing your reference point. Mm. Um, one thing Preston talked about was the Montauk Project dealt with time references. So mm -hmm. your, your reference to this time. And, and then... And he talked exactly about that. So when you lose your time references, where are you going? You're going to another time. Now, just because you're losing your time references doesn't mean you're going into the future or the past in this timeline. Why should it? Huh. It's, 
it's like you're you, you're going you're going somewhere, but it's not necessarily. And where are you going to go? You're going to go to the place that is you're attracted to or is attracting you. And what other subtle forms of energy, electronics, and or manipulation are you being subjected to? It's not necessarily going to the past or going to the future in on on this timeline. It's not right. Safe, but it certainly. Uh, you're losing your boundaries. Makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, you know, and we could talk about the Philadelphia experiment under the same premise, I think, you know, in terms of a reference point and how that came, you know, to be what it is and why why they moved forward the way they did uh, just after that project in terms of the research. But um, I, I know we were running a little short on time. We got about 20 minutes here and I, I still have a couple questions I want to throw at you. Um, in respect to all those who lost their lives at Montauk, it's been expressed that some of these stoles, excuse me, some of these souls still linger on the grounds of Camp Hero. Uh, has there ever been any effort to help them move forward? I mean, I know Preston, Al, and Duncan were aware of the presence, and you know they voiced that through some of the videos. But did they ever try to help those who were earthbound by the trauma experienced at Montauk? Were they able to? Um, I don't know. There have been some of the most important souls in in. Montauk are the souls of the pharaohs, the Montauk Indians, mm -hmm. the royal tribe of Long Island who are known as pharaohs. And they've got a cemetery that has been very under acknowledged. And those are the important souls, the original souls on this timeline. Mm -hmm. They go back into history and they were the custodians of that grid. It's very important to run, and this is what came up in my research for the Pyramids of Montauk, um, which is the third book in the series, currently being reprinted. That book uh, explains that the in, in the days of Egypt, the interlocutor or the go-between between, between heaven and earth was the Pharaoh. Mm. And, and that was his job to interpret or to interdict or you know predict famines or or this and whatnot or to save money uh, save food for the famines and there are books written by uh ralph ellis one of which is jesus last of the pharaohs he identifies the whole hebrew lineage with the G egyptian lineage and says how it was kind of pulled apart and uh separated to confuse everybody but they were actually the same lineage and of course the Montauk pharaohs were the custodians. There were there were pyramids up there at one point, mm -hmm. not as grand as it what was in Egypt, but this was a major station of energy on the planet, and th and this is where the name pharaoh derives from. So, and you have what you have with the Montauk project, you have an effort by the secret government or whoever to act as an interlocutor between heaven and earth. Although it's, it's much more of an uh, interlocutor of earth and hell. Mm -hmm. So, and, and Duncan and Preston went deeply into the domains of heaven and hell. Uh, not so much in a religious sense, but not, it wasn't irreligious either. It was mm -hmm. in a esoteric sense that they would contact different domains that would come through in the experience. So uh, the souls of Montauk are, uh, and, and of course, every, every, all the devastation that was done out there is sort of on top of those souls. It's like comparing uh, the saints of Christianity to all the people that died in the Crusades. Ah, uh, okay. So, uh, and, and and what are the now? By the way, the oh the the area of of the Temple Mount and all that stuff around the Mount of Olives is an ancient necropolis. It's an ancient necropolis, which means uh, you know city of the dead. There's a lot of dead people under there, and then you have more and more dead. You know, could come with the Crusades and all that, and, and they are the later day. Doesn't mean they're unimportant, but they're 
you know, the, the people that died in the Crusades was a, was an, they were all part of an accident that was waiting to happen, being uh, enthusiastically taken from their homes to mm -hmm. go fight a holy war to, you know, bring back, you know, the Holy Land from the heathens. Um, a big, a big mis mistake. Very curious, man. I, I really like some of the points that you're bringing up here that <laughs> I'll have to take a, a future time to kind of delve into with you because, you know, when you get into something like this, there are just branches that spread out and some of them connect. Eventually they all, you know, come from the same source, but there's so much to look into in regards to this. Uh, the, the Delta T antenna, that was at Camp Hero. It was underground, as I understand, uh, for many reasons. They did it this way. Uh, is it still there today, possibly? And are there projects of a similar nature still in progress? Not necessarily at Montauk. I think we can assert that there's something happening there, but we may not know what it is. But in, in general, are there other projects that sort of parallel what they did in Montauk out there happening now? Well, yes. Uh, as to where what the status of the antenna is, I can't I can't answer that because uh, there is an extensive underground beneath the transmitter tower where the where the antenna once was, um, but I really don't know the current status of it. the mm -hmm. the The Delta T antenna, which is basically an octahedral antenna, is uh, the top half of which is emulates the Great Pyramid. There are uh, the Great Pyramid would also have a corresponding uh, structure beneath it. Mm -hmm. So, oh, okay, yeah. In in that regards, uh, you can identify certain aspects of the pyramid with a time device, whether it be the King's Chamber uh, or the Queen's Chamber. It's and a, a pyramid is an is an amplifier of energy. And it's a, it's a, it also is a gateway to dark energy. Mm -hmm. So that, then that's the infinite. So it's like you're in a zone where anything can, might, will happen. It's going to tend to happen more energetically, mm -hmm. than, but it, it might manifest as such. But with regards to the most significant uh, projects that, I would refer to Romania and what's going on in Romania currently with the books that I published there. Uh, keeping in mind, I was introduced to Romania by Dr. David Anderson. Mm -hmm. And the book uh, Transylvania Sunrise, uh, which is the first book in the series which, discuss, which discusses a underground uh, chamber beneath the Romanian Sphinx. There is a Sphinx in Romania. And, uh, what, and I've been there. I haven't been into the chamber, but I've been to the Sphinx several times. And... Uh, according to the book, there's a chamber some 300 yards down, which is holographic technology. It has a chair in it where the author uh, says that he uh, was able to go back and see the history of the world. Oh, wow. There are tunnels within that chamber that go to other facilities, one of which is beneath the Giza Plateau in Egypt, where there was a time travel device where you could travel in time consciously, not physically, but consciously. Mm -hmm. He talks about his adventures there in the mystery of Egypt. So these projects, the projects that he, he, and right now in his latest book, which I just published in October, which is called the Etheric Crystal, he talks about building a device which is very reminiscent of the Montauk chair, although he's very positive. This is not about controlling minds. It's about developing minds mm. and developing humanity. So the Transylvania series of books is, is uh, sort of a, uh, re, I wouldn't call it refurbished. I'd call it a, a new edition of uh, space-time projects that is much more user-friendly, much more enlightenment, and not dedicated to mind control and mm -hmm. messing with people. Mm. Well, understanding time travel the way we do, do you think it's more of a distraction to pursue a physical ability to do that or should we perhaps be more internal about it and and go the way of consciousness well i will I, that's a very good question and i have a two-pronged answer there first i 
I had written on my, uh, and those who want to subscribe to the time travel education center.com. I do periodically uh, post uh, to the general public and, and to the paid subscribers, you know, differently at well. Uh, and I, one time I asked a question last earlier this year, I asked if you could travel in time, what would you do? If you had access to the time reactor and almost all of the answers were well intended. I mean, talk about, I'd fix this. I'd fix that. I would do this. I would do that. And they were all well into very well intended. Nobody said anything negative, mm -hmm. but one of my friends pointed out, he was the exception to the rule. He said, nobody talked about looking into themselves and fixing themselves. Ah. And I thought that was very insightful. And I shared that with the audience. It's like, you know, we're looking at what's wrong out there. What's wrong in here? And, and again, Scientology was an opportunity to, to do that. It was an opportunity to look inside and see what was wrong with you. And one of those uh, aspects in myself, I said, you know, Scientology, um, one of the gain, uh, abilities gained at the higher end of the, their chart was freedom, a total, what is it called? Uh, freedom from overwhelm and total self-determinism. And I realized that total freedom uh, included freedom from Scientology. You had to be free from it or you would be locked into it. And, and that was like a, a license to exit. As I say, not with, not in a pejorative sense. Right. That, that was pejorative to the people who were, who were practicing it diabolically to the detriment of uh, themselves and others. Um, but yeah, you, you have to be free. You have to be totally free. And, and that's, that, that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful thing, but the, idea to look in. So time to, to get back, and I have a second prong to your to your, mm -hmm. your question. To get back to, to time travel is, okay, if you can go back in time, what are you going to do? You know, you're going to go back and fix this or fix that? I don't know. It's, it's not really something we have access to. Now, the second prong is that I, I have looked rather deeply into the prospect of you know, time travel, the very question you, you brought up. And one thing is when you, be, and this is for David Anderson, he says, when you look into time, you change it. So you have to be very careful. Just observing it changes the timeline. Okay, you know, I understand that. Yes. Yes. So what, if you can start effectuating time travel on any level, any level that's even minorly significant, you're breeding chaos. You're breeding chaos, whether it be mental or whether it be physical. And chaos is a part of life. Where it mm. becomes unwieldy is when you're breeding more chaos than you can handle, either in the mental sphere, the physical sphere, or the emotional sphere. So this it becomes an issue of chaos. And I've intended to put into my coming newsletter, I haven't written it uh, yet, but it is, there's different definitions of chaos. There's the chaos of chaos magicians. There's the chaos of mathematics. Mm. There's the chaos of physics. And there's the English definitionary dictionary of chaos. They're all different. They all serve a different purpose. But in ordinary time travel, as we're discussing here, wow. Like, like say in the movie, The Time Traveler, the guy vacates. He's gone. They don't even know what happens to him. <laughs> and he comes back all disheveled and I think he's late for dinner or something. And then he tells them this incredible story and they don't know what to make of him. And now he's weird. You know, it's like, uh, it's, it's, th th there is a chaos factor. So one has to be a master of chaos. If one is going to be a master of time in that regard of time, tra I should say time travel. That very much makes sense. It really does. And in looking at any of these concepts, you know, understanding the duality, the dualistic nature that we live in and uh, that both sides are very appropriate to create the whole that we have now. I think, you know, again, the balance is really the biggest thing here we can take as human beings under 
you know, going into subjects like this or, you know, undertaking something as extravagant as time travel and turning it into something more experiential. Uh, and again, there are very many levels that you could possibly do this within a psyche and, uh, you know, before it becomes a physical phenomena. Mm -hmm. But Peter, I, we're just about out of time here. I want to thank you so much for coming on and would love to have you back because I know we just literally scratched the surface and you have so many books out there that I want everybody to go and check out, please. Because if you've enjoyed this broadcast today, this again is only scratching the surface of the immense amount of research and intellectual uh, opinion that Peter has put into his literature. Please go and check him out. Uh, I will have his bio in the description in more of uh, an exaggerated form, if you will, but I do have the websites that you can find his work on. Uh, you can find it at skybooksusa.com and also check out the time travel education center.com. He has mentioned this a handful of times today, and you can check out what his work has been continuing on that subject. But Peter, thank you so much for coming on today. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you very much. If you'd like, hang out for a second. I'll say my proper goodbyes off camera. If you have to go, I understand that. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll take you off for just a moment, Peter. Well, guys, thank you very much for joining us today on this lovely afternoon. It is Tuesday, December 1st, 2020, and Peter Moon was my guest tonight, today. <laughs> I'm used to saying tonight. Uh, go ahead and check out his new book that was released in January, L. Ron Hubbard, The Tao of Insanity. Uh, it is available now wherever books are sold. You can find it right on Amazon just for a quick and easy one right there if you don't go to his website and purchase it directly. Uh, please check out... Richie G at Goofon, he'll be on tonight. Whether he's doing a live or premiere is is uh, time will tell. Uh, either way, he's doing something, and it will be great. Also, please continue to check out Third Phase of Moon, guys. Both of these channels have been very supportive of the, uh, Dark Hour Paranormal, and I appreciate having them uh, as individuals as well as the creative entities that they've created to be behind what we're doing here and again thank you very much excuse me thank you everyone for being here this afternoon we'll be back tomorrow night at eight o'clock with wild trees to talk about spirituality uh, ets and uh paranormal phenomena all right guys thank you very much i'm not going to play the outro today uh just because honestly i don't have it set up and i'm not going to waste any more time we've had a fantastic afternoon so guys have a wonderful rest of your day and i will see you tomorrow night.